Well, a number of years ago, and when I say that, I mean it's been a long time now since I was in university. Uh, but when I was in university, there was a very important uh, restaurant, we'll call it a restaurant just for the sake of the illustration, restaurant that opened or was going to open near my house uh, called Krispy Kreme Donuts. And I grew up again in Chicago and Krispy Kreme Donuts is a southern U.S. states thing, not a northern U.S. states thing. Um, but we were ecstatic that we were getting a Krispy Kreme Donuts. And so I thought to myself, the most obvious thing for me to do is to be the first customer at Krispy Kreme Donuts uh, near my house. And so the night before, I gathered a bunch of friends together and uh, we drove my, uh, my car, which was actually, as a university student, it was very strange, I drove a, a minivan. Um, and uh, it's definitely a mom car. And, uh, but you can fit a lot of people in it. And, uh, and it's the ideal thing to stay up all night in the parking lot of a Krispy Kreme that was about to open early the next morning. And so we drove to this parking lot and sat there all night because I thought, you know, other people are going to want to be the first customer. And they're going to be as committed, if not more committed than me. And so we got there about 9 o'clock at night and uh, stayed there. Uh, all night long, being vigilant, watching for other cars to come into the, the parking lot, and nobody came until about 6 a.m. the next morning, and I thought, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I've been here all night. I will be the first customer, and so we ran out of the car up to the door and then stood there for another hour while we waited for the shop to open, and uh, the great part about it is the people that got out of the car were people from my church. I knew them. I was like, there's no way you're going to beat me to this. And so finally they open the door and uh, we come flooding in and I'm the first customer to stand there and order the very first donuts at this Krispy Kreme Donuts and I say to the person there, I'll have seven dozen donuts please. <laughs> why seven dozen? Well, you know, the real question is, is why wouldn't I do that? Everyone loves donuts. The truth is everybody knows that donuts are bad for you. In reality, every time I see a donut, and let's be honest, to see a donut is to eat a donut, right? Doug's, yeah, yeah. But to see a donut is to eat it. And so whenever I eat a donut, though, I think to myself, well, it looks like I'll never understand what it means to be a grandfather. Um, so I bought seven donuts, though, because, partly because that's how much money I had in my pocket. But I really bought seven dozen because I wanted to take those donuts back to my campus. I wanted everybody at my campus to appreciate what I appreciate. I wanted everyone to find these donuts to be worthy of praise. I wanted people to eat one and say, yeah, that is a good donut, and I should get some too. In a way, I was being a worship leader. I was attempting to gather worshipers from every classroom and hallway and residence hall and campus to find enjoyment in what I enjoyed. And you, you do that too. You do that too. Every time you see a good film, every time you eat in a good restaurant, every time you find a nice holiday spot or discover a new show on Netflix, anytime you find something good, chances are you will sing its praises to other people and you will invite them to join you. You exclaim the praise of the new film. You describe with great detail the taste of the meal. You give advice on which hotel to book and where's the best place on the beach to lay your towel and to catch some sun. And why do we do that? It's because we're worshipers. We are all made to worship. And you might not think of it this way, but since the beginning of humankind, humans have been worshipers. In ancient times, in every ancient city, you would find temples where people went to worship the gods. And then as time went on in the West, there was an era of Christianity where in every village you find a church, in every city a cathedral, and though many of those remain, the buildings are still there, they're empty. But it doesn't mean that we've stopped worshiping as a culture. In my city, Liverpool, we worship the teams in red and blue. And every weekend, thousands of worshipers from all over the world wearing their team's color colors enter the great cathedrals of Anfield and Goodison Park to sing their songs and give praise and honor and glory to the men on the pitch. 
Right now, it's the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club, and around our city, believe it or not, there are signs all over our city that say, Brian Epstein died for you, as people come to worship. On the high street of every village, town, and city, people enter the worship halls of John Lewis and Zara and H&M. Lining up every day at the ATMs are worshipers of every kind, and riding the lifts of the great skyscrapers of London and walking the halls of Westminster are those who worship power and success. These are our temples today, football grounds and department stores and banks and high-rises and parliamentary chambers. That's where our culture gathers to worship today. And today we worship the very same gods, the ancients worship, the gods of beauty and power and success and money, but we just worship them by another name. Worship is perhaps the best way to describe what we're doing day in and day out as we cheer for our team or buy our clothes and our gadgets or count our money or eat our food or watch our films and shows. Worship's the best term we have to describe that. And you might be wondering, why on earth is he talking about worship? I thought this was Mission Sunday. Shouldn't he be talking about missions? Well, the passage we're looking at today shows us that missions is all about worship. In fact, it shows us that the great goal of missions is worship. Look again, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. In this passage, we're going to see three things. We're going to see the task of missions, we're going to see the cost of missions, and we're going to see the call of missions. And the great task or the great goal of missions we see from this passage is to gather people who worship Jesus Christ. That's what's going on in this great scene in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. In the first chapter of Revelation, you learn this this book written to seven real churches in Asia, which is now modern-day Turkey. And what you find out in chapters 2 and 3 is that each of these churches is facing immense pressure, both from within and from without. Under pressure, whether or not they are going to remain faithful to Christ, whether or not they are going to carry on the task of missions and be his faithful witnesses in the last days. And then in chapter 4, the author goes through a door into the heavenly throne room. And in this throne room is a worship service, and there are fantastic creatures and elders with crowns, and they're all bowing down and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then when Jesus arrives on the scene in chapter 5, they give this very same worship to him. And they ascribe to him power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. But notice then what happens in this great scene. What is true in heaven The worship that Jesus receives in heaven is to expand to earth. Jesus is to be worshipped on earth as he is in heaven. And not just to one corner of the earth. Notice where Jesus is gathering his worshippers from. You purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, verse 9. And when we look through the door of heaven, as John is doing here, we catch a glimpse of eternal heavenly worship. And it's not a couple hundred people from Worthing. It's not a couple thousand from Sussex. It's not even a few hundred thousand from Britain or a couple million from all across Europe. Jesus purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so if the ultimate goal of Jesus' death and resurrection is to gather people from every tribe and language and people and nation, then that means his his goal is global. The task of missions is incomplete until this global vision is accomplished. And notice how it works. It works out in concentric circles. The groupings get larger and larger as you go. It starts with a tribe. And then it moves out to those who share the same language. And then it moves even further to an ethnic grouping. And then finally to a nation. And what you're getting to see here in Revelation 5 is the application of Jesus' missionary call to his disciples in Matthew 28 to make disciples of all nations. 
And in Acts 1.8, when he says that they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This picture of heavenly worship shows us the task of missions is to gather a diverse group. John sees a clear distinction of diversity amongst this worshiping crowd from every tribe and language and people and nation. It's diverse, but notice it's unified around a singular purpose, and that is to worship the Lamb who was slain. Verse 10, you have made them, those who he's purchased from every tribe, language, people, and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And you know, this verse is telling us, it's telling us that there will be a great, the great diversity of verse 9, people from every race and background and land and on and on. But even though that's going to be there, there's going to be no class distinction, no racism, no special religious hierarchy. This massive worshiping community that Jesus is gathering will be diverse, but equal. Kurds worshiping and ruling alongside Iraqis, Polish and English side by side. Germans and Turks, Americans and Mexicans, whites and blacks and Hispanics and Asians and Persians, all serving the Lord together. And as you read through Revelation, you begin to get the overwhelming sense that all of history, all of creation is moving its way towards this very same vision, the gathering of people from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation to worship Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. You see it in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It says, John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Keep going, it's in chapter 15, verse 4. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And when you get to the end, it's right there in the very picture of the new heavens and the new earth. When the heavens and the earth are joined together as one, Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Literally, that reads peoples, it's plural. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Do you see that the overwhelming sense that this task of the global task of missions is to gather people from every tribe and language and people and nation to worship Jesus Christ. And if that's true, then where's our mission field? Where are we called to go? Well, it's in two places. One, it's out there. It's in the nations. If this is the goal of missions, then we need to be reaching the unreached. We need to get the gospel to tribes and languages and peoples and nations where they haven't heard about Jesus yet. And the truth is that missionary task, it's not complete. There's still a long way to go. According to the Joshua Project, which is a research initiative that's dedicated to keeping track and defining this unfinished task that we have, according to them, there are 16,584 people groups on earth. And of that 16,584, almost half of them are still unreached. 40% have yet to hear about Jesus Christ. 40% have never heard the gospel. That accounts to 6,733 people groups. 
It's 3.1 billion people. Jesus is gathering them. Every tribe and language and people and nation. And for sure, many of those unreached groups are in what's called the 1040 window. That's the part of the world that's between 10 degrees and 40 degrees north of the equator. If you don't know where that is, it's North Africa, the Middle East, and most of Asia. 60% of the people who live in that part of the world are unreached. It's still a massive task to gather worshipers from there. Not only because of the sheer number of unreached people, but if you know anything about that part of the world, it's their animosity towards, it's their resistance to the gospel. And so the mission field, it's out there. But secondly, it's right here. The Joshua Project, this research initiative, they estimate there are 32 unreached people groups who live in Britain. If you don't know your geography, that's where you are now. (laughs) 32. And some of that is because people from every tribe and language and people and nation have moved here. A couple of years ago, somebody from Sri Lanka moved as an asylum seeker to Liverpool. I'm going to protect his name. We're going to call him Sean. And he comes from a Muslim family in Sri Lanka. And if you know anything about Sri Lanka, you know that it's not historically a Muslim nation, but a couple of generations ago, some Muslim missionaries moved to Sri Lanka and started winning converts to Islam and started a Muslim community in Sri Lanka. Well, this, this man, Sean, who moved to Liverpool from Sri Lanka, he's a direct descendant only two generations removed from those first Muslim missionaries who went. There's grandparents. And his father was prominent in the community, and his father was actually killed by the Sri Lankan government at a time when Sri Lanka was actually hostile towards Islam. And so he fled. He left to save his life. As a Muslim, he had to leave a country. And he came here. And he moved to Liverpool. And when Sean came to Liverpool, he met get this, a retired couple from our church. And I'll protect their names too. So we'll call them Phil and Ruth. I might get that wrong, but that's what we're going to call them. And Phil and Ruth, do you know what they're spending their retirement doing? They haven't moved to Spain. They're living in a rough, very rough neighborhood in Liverpool. And they're spending their retirement years caring for and evangelizing asylum seekers. They're not with a missions agency. It's just what the Lord has put on their heart to do. They're learning Arabic. And they always have between one and four asylum seekers living with them in their home. And when they met Sean, they did with him what they do with every asylum seeker the Lord puts in their path. They spent time with him. They helped him with his asylum claim. They brought him to our church and to their small group and eventually they brought him to Christianity Explored and after he spent seven weeks going through Christianity Explored he prayed to receive Christ and we baptized him and you know to our knowledge he's the first ever person from this Muslim community in Sri Lanka to become a Christian He's been sent back now, and this is why I'm protecting his name. His life is regularly in danger from that Muslim community. But his great hope in returning was that his mother would hear the gospel and become a Christian. I don't want you to miss the significance of this story. This is a real-life example of a previously unreached people group reached by a retired couple in a rough neighborhood in Liverpool. You know, it's not, though, just the nations moving here. It's the Brits who are unreached. It's Scousers and Brummies and Londoners and Scots and Welsh and whatever you call people from Southern Sunny Worthing. They're unreached. Did you know the most hardened communities in the UK are towns like Worthing? It's one of the most difficult communities in the whole country to reach lost people. John Stevens, who's the national director of the FIC, in a recent paper, he wrote this. 
The most hardened communities to the gospel are those that are white, British, moderately affluent, and aspirant. They have little apparent interest in or need for the gospel. They have a polite disinterest which makes sustained evangelism difficult. Does that sound like home? The FIC estimates that more than 97% of the United Kingdom don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord. 97%. Just to give you some perspective, China is 83%. And this suggests that revivals like happened in the 18th and 19th century, they're not what we need today. What we need now in Britain is missions. We don't need to revive the UK. We need to evangelize the UK. The work that needs to happen here is much more like the work of pioneering missionaries to an unreached tribe in Asia like Hudson Taylor than it is like the great revivals of D.L. Moody and Billy Graham. Revivals work when people already know the gospel but have rejected it. But we live in a time and a place where most people don't know the gospel. They've never even heard it. I was recently visited a bar, uh, a pub near our office in Liverpool. And it's a famous pub. Uh, I went there to meet somebody. um, And uh, by the time I got there, he had had so many drinks, we couldn't even have a conversation. And so I thought, well, I'm here. So let me see if I can talk to somebody else about Jesus. And uh, it's this famous pub. It's famous because the only one that uh, ever kicked John Lennon out of it. And they're really proud of that, and they love to tell you that story. And so I struck up a conversation with the woman who is uh, attending the bar. And uh, one of my greatest uh, evangelistic tools is my accent, Uh, although Americans tell me I have a mid-Atlantic accent. I don't know what that means. Um, But people always say, well, what are you doing here? And I get to say, well, let me tell you. I came here to work with the church so I could tell people here about Jesus. And so this lady asked me the classic question, well, what, what is it that you're doing here? And, and so I said, well, I work at a, a church. Our office is just around the corner from here. It's about a 12-second walk away from here. And she said, oh, you work in the church, so does that mean you clean it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do. Uh, I said, no, I'm a, I'm a pastor at the church. It's a 40-year-old woman. She said to me, What's a pastor? I said, well, you know, I tell people what it's like to follow Jesus, and I help them understand what the Bible says, and I I give sermons on a Sunday. And she said to me, I'm not kidding, she said to me, what's a sermon? She had no idea. This is in Britain. This is a scouser. A couple of months ago, my wife and I were in a taxi coming back from a friend's house, on a Saturday night, it's about 10 o'clock. My wife and I live in town, near where all the clubbing goes on in Liverpool, not because we club, but because that's just where we live. Um, uh, But we were visiting some friends that live in um, outside the city center, and uh, kind of a student area, actually. And so the taxi driver just assumed he picked up two relatively young-looking people. Uh, It was dark, so didn't see my gray hair. And um, he just assumed he was taking us into town to, to go clubbing. And so he said, uh, so you guys are going to party tonight? And we said, no, no, we're headed home. And he's like, headed home? It's Saturday night. Yeah, um, we're, we're going to go home and go to bed. He goes, well, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said to him, well, we're Christians, so we're going to church. And I could only see his eyes in the rear of your mirror. And this, watch my face. This is what I saw in the rear of your mirror. That's what he did. <laughs> He could not believe that two people who were below the age of, we'll say, 60, (laughs) 40, I don't know, would would spend their Sunday morning going to church. He couldn't believe it. And so I said, well, tell me about what you believe. And he talked about this modern philosopher that he sometimes reads. And, And then he said to me, he said, look, complete open door. Why should I believe what you believe? Why should I be a Christian? I had 30 seconds to share the gospel with him before we got to the house. This is the state of Britain. It's unreached. 
These are all people who have never heard about their Savior. They've never heard about Jesus, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, but who is also the Lamb who is slain. They've never stopped to worship the one seated on the throne who was and is and is to come, who's the Alpha and the Omega. But don't you want them to? I mean, if the gospel is such good news that you've clung to it, if it's such good news that some of you have been worshipers of Jesus Christ for 40 or 50 or 60 or even maybe 70 years... Don't you want other people to know that gospel too? If you're 14 or 15 or 16 or 20, or if you're a parent of somebody in that age, their whole life is in front of them. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to encourage your children to do with their lives? Please go be a doctor or a lawyer, or please go and tell people about Jesus. Don't you want people who live in Chiang Mai and people who live on Chapel Road to worship him? If worshiping Jesus is so sweet and so good and it's what caused you to come here today, don't you want them to worship him too? If worshiping Jesus is the goal of all of human history, don't you want to be part of gathering those worshipers? Because look at what it cost him to gather worshipers from every tribe and language and people and nation. Look again at verse 9. They sang this new song, because you were slain with your, and with your blood you purchased for God. Persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And don't you see what it cost Jesus to gather these worshipers? It cost him his life. He shed his own blood. The picture that John gets here is of a Passover lamb. This is language from the book of Exodus. Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb who was slain. And it's Jesus' blood that does the work of saving. Not only is it Exodus language, it's Isaiah's language. Jesus is the lamb of Isaiah 53. He's the lamb led to the slaughter. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. The Lord laid on him the iniquities of us all. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. A couple of years ago, I went with my uh, wife and her family to go and visit uh, the village where her father grew up in the mountains of Albania. That's where he grew up. And while we were there, um, they wanted to, you know, have a great meal for us. And so uh, my father-in-law's cousin uh, at the time was a, was a goat farmer. And so we slaughtered a goat. And I remember before we did it, it was, it was both funny and terrifying at the same time, actually, because uh, Luigi was his name, and, and Luigi would wear a jacket like this as he did his job of being a shepherd. And uh, we set a goat aside, and, uh, and we've got the goat, and he's holding it. And uh, here we are, you know, in a mountain village in Albania. I didn't think people had cell phones. But he's holding the goat by his front hoofs, and Luigi gets a cell phone call. And so he hands me the goat. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. And so I'm holding a goat like this while Luigi walks off and has a cell phone call. And I'm sitting here holding this goat thinking, my goodness, this goat is about to die. This goat is about to shed its blood so that I can eat dinner. And sure enough, Luigi hangs up his phone, drops it back in his pocket, comes, grabs the goat right out of my hands, and within seconds, the goat's blood had been uh, shed and was killed. And that goat died so we can eat dinner. I don't think I've ever appreciated a meal more in my life. That goat shed its blood so that I could eat. But how much more costly, how much more valuable, how much more worthy is the precious blood of Jesus who died so that I could live? And notice this from verse 9. Jesus didn't steal us away from our sin. He didn't rob us away from the grave. He purchased us. It was costly. If you're a Christian today, you're only a Christian. You're only free because Jesus paid your ransom. He purchased you with his blood. He secured your freedom, your immunity from the curse of death by enduring death itself. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the, the eternally existing one without beginning or end, he dies the death that you should have died. Jesus Christ, the holy Son of God, the eternally perfect and sinless and spotless one, bears the punishment for the sin that you deserve. It cost Jesus his life to purchase you. 
It cost Jesus the pain of the cross and the torment of separation from the Father to redeem you and to purchase people from every tribe and language and people and nation. You see, because God demands the price of death and separation from him as payment of sin. That's why Jesus did it. So mercifully, graciously, instead, God himself pays the price. He bears the whole cost of our forgiveness through the death of his son. This is the great love of God. What great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifices for our sins. Listen, gathering worshipers is not cheap. It's not cheap. Fickle, flaky love. It's costly, sacrificial, lavishing love that caused Jesus to spend all that he has to pay a king's ransom for each and every worshiper. And when you begin to recognize the cost of missions, that Jesus shed his own blood to purchase not only you, but people from every tribe and language and people and nation. When you begin to recognize that, you'll find yourself receiving and taking up the call of missions. And what is the call of missions? It's to join with Jesus in gathering these worshipers. In Matthew 28, it's to make disciples of all nations. In Acts 1.8, it's to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here in the book of Revelation, when you read these seven letters in chapters 2 and 3, each church is called to be victorious and to join with Jesus, the faithful witness, and bearing testimony to him. This is the call of missions. To join with Jesus, the faithful witness, by bearing testimony about him and gathering these worshipers from all across the globe. And so what does that call look like? Well, it looks like three things, very briefly, three things. Most people send, some go, but all gather. In Romans 10, the Apostle Paul explains that anyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. Anybody who calls on Jesus' name for salvation will be saved. And here he is talking about this gathering of people from every tribe and language and people and nation. But then starting in verse 14, he asks a series of questions. He says, how then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? And it's obvious what Paul is explaining here. He's saying if the nations are going to call in the name of Jesus, they need to hear about him first. If they never hear about Jesus, they never have a chance to call on him. And so someone needs to go. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But do you notice the last question in verse 15? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? And for most of you here in this church, that's going to be your role in this great missionary task is to help raise up missionaries who will go, to fund them, to pray for them, to support them as they go to the unreached people to gather worshipers. And when you do that, you're part of this great missionary task to gather worshipers from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so Worthing Tabernacle, would you please be ascending church? Would you please raise up and fund and pray for and support missionaries as they're sent? But notice not everyone's a sender. Some are, but must, some must go. That's verse 14. How can they call if they haven't believed in him? And how can they believe in one if they haven't heard? So they need someone to go and preach to them. If the missionary task is to be completed, someone needs to go, and perhaps that's you. Well, have you really considered your calling? Maybe you think your calling is done. You've finished work. You've finished the task. But how could they call in one they've not believed in? How can they believe in one in whom they've not heard? Perhaps God's calling one or two of you. Perhaps he's calling a young couple or a teenager or a university student or, or a retired couple to use your retirement to gather worshipers from every tribe and language and people and nation. Well, regardless if you're a sender or you're called to go, everyone is called to gather. 
Paul finishes his list of questions in chapter, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, by quoting from Isaiah 52, 7. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so what if? What if you dedicated your retirement years to reaching the lost and worthing? Go out with a bang. Spend your remaining years gathering worshipers of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing to do. What beautiful feet you would have. You heard the stats. 97% of people in Britain are not trusting in Jesus for salvation. 97% of the people in this country, in your home, are lost and are destined for hell. And think about your street. Think about those who live across the street from you and behind you and to the left and to the right. Statistically, they're lost. And they need you to tell them about Jesus. John Stevens, in the article I quoted earlier, says that the time when people are most likely to trust in Jesus is when they're bereaved, when they've lost a loved one, a spouse, a friend, when they're sick, when the diagnosis isn't good. And let's just be honest about Worthing for a moment. It's full of retired people, and that means that it's full of people who come here to live out the last years of their lives. And along with that comes bereavement and sickness. John Stevens also points out that single mothers are often coming to Christ as churches come around them and support them. And that means that Cameo is possibly one of, if not the most strategic ministries that Worthing Tabernacle has. And those of you who are retired, those of you who have teenagers, those of you who have raised young children already have so much wisdom to offer. And as you do that, you gain the right to tell them about Jesus. And lastly, Stevens points out that many who come to faith do so when they're teenagers. And Worthing has a lot of teenagers and young families and children who will one day be teenagers soon. They all need to hear the good news. Each and every one of us is to be involved in the great missionary task of gathering worshipers. That's what all of history is moving forward to. And people from every tribe and language and people and nation will stand before the Lamb and they will say, you are worthy to receive power and honor and glory and praise because you are the Lamb who was slain and you've purchased back people from every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. And so the goal of missions is to gather worshipers from all those places, from all over the world. And so go out into the world. Go out into Worthing and to Prague and to Chiang Mai and to Lisbon and to the villages of Tanzania and invite people to worship Jesus Christ. Call them to worship Christ rather than their football club, to worship the one who sits on the throne rather than John Lewis. Call them to worship he who was and is and is to come rather than their career or their family or their possessions. Call them to worship the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, rather than their ancestors or Allah. Let's join with this great task of gathering worshipers of Jesus from every tribe and language and people and nation. And to do so, let's ask the Lord's help. Our Lord, we thank you that you have shed your blood for us, that you gave that costly gift in order to purchase us, to redeem us from our sin and death and from the grave, in order that one day we will gather together in the great assembly, people from every tribe and language and people and nation to worship you. Please, Lord, would you call us to that task? Would you help us with that task? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.